artist, DJ, architect, founder of Off-White, and creative director at Louis Vuitton for four years, becoming the first African American to hold such a position at a French luxury brand before passing away in 2021 due to a rare aggressive form of cancer. What was it that made him so unique and influential on culture? I took the task to do a deep dive, and after 30 hours of absorbing, analyzing, and reflecting on Virgil Abloh's talks, I've interpreted some of his lifelong wisdoms into eight key themes. Heading into college, Virgil's dad wanted him to become an engineer, and so he obliged and studied as an engineer as a way to pay him back. On the fifth year, however, he googled where you could do an architecture master's with a graduate engineering degree and found the Illinois Institute of Technology. As a foundational course, he took an arts history class on the Renaissance, and it was the mix of these different studies that he attributed the spark and rewiring of his brain. You might have heard terms such as jack-of-all-trades, renaissance men, generalists, or polymaths. These are all types of people that transcend boundaries and have many skills and practices in multiple areas rather than a specialization in one. Despite studying architecture, Virgil knew from the very beginning he wasn't going to necessarily practice it. Talking about the time, one of his teachers brought up a grim fact that only a small amount of them would build buildings, and how he thought, touche, I'm not here to build buildings. In fact, in one of his talks, one of his main messages to a room full of architecture students was that young architects can change the world by not building buildings. He wasn't there to practice architecture. He was there to learn how to design. Buildings have to exist for the people and the communities that they exist in. There's also constraints like the number of rooms, the clients, etc. And likewise for fashion, designs have to be made with an end user in mind. And it's through these parallels that Virgil applied his architectural process into fashion. We can see this philosophy of doing the opposite in how he viewed and built retail stores. Virgil's very anti-store. He believed there was nothing modern about them and even went as far as to say they were corny. Instead, he opted for experiences, eating, performance area, space for music or fashion shows. In the Hong Kong Off-White store, he built a jungle with motion-activated rain and sounds. In another one of his stores, he even had items that were meant to be stolen. In the same vein, when it came to fashion, he focused a lot of time not on fashion, instead seeing it as a story device to communicate ideas. Fashion alone for him felt too literal. It was always outward thinking, looking at different industries and reading or watching movies that led to translating into new collections. And his debut collection at Louis Vuitton was just that. With a yellow brick road and rainbow chromatic elements, the collection beautifully referenced the movie Wizard of Oz. The show received mixed reviews, but looking deeper you can start to see the parallels of the two stories and realize it was more than just the clothes. Dorothy was a long way from home. When she reached the Emerald City with her companions, they were denied access by a gatekeeper. Eventually, they're allowed in and see behind the curtain. It was a beautiful allusion to Virgil Abloh's journey thus far in the fashion industry from Rockford, Illinois, starting with a screen printed t-shirt to making it as creative director at Louis Vuitton and debuting in Paris. If you work linearly, then you have no room. Do the opposite, it just feels better. That space in between gives you a new experience that you can apply and problem solve. People naturally tend to categorize things to understand them easier, but by disregarding the sacred space of keeping everything individual, you can find valid ways to go forward into the future. When someone, like someone asks you for a jewelry design, the first opportunity missed is to design jewelry. The right, contemporary sense is to question what jewelry is and then propose that as an answer and immediately there's attention. With a better understanding of what it means to have no discipline, it then becomes easy to understand the concept of Virgil Abloh's brand Off-White. The name itself is a nod to the undefined, the idea that gray doesn't define the middle of two absolutes. This refusal to commit to absolutes and the constant exploration of this gray area became the organizing structure of his designs, a symbol of continual progression rather than a finished product. One unique philosophy that formed the backbone of Off-White's ethos is the concept of the tourist and the purist. A purist has deep, specialized knowledge and typically prefers tradition. On the flip side, a tourist may be someone that doesn't know that much about a particular area and only has surface level knowledge. Tourists and purists are everywhere. They're often inside the comment sections of Instagram posts or YouTube videos. I personally run a series where I post objects that I think look pleasing and oftentimes it's either someone talking about their great-grandfather who owned this object and passed it down for generations to use, or someone saying, bro, it's just a shelf. Virgil knew about this phenomenon early on and decided to capitalize on it. Instead of seeing it as a problem to fix, he made the very clear distinction that neither perspective was necessarily better or worse. They're simply different ways of experiencing art. While a tourist may not know much about a thing, they can be open to exploration and can see things from a fresh perspective. 
In his work, Virgil strived to engage both the tourist and the purist. So how did Virgil do this? One way was using quotes and labels as a sort of motif. He often discussed the value of irony equity and how modern culture thrived off of the ironic. Just look at memes. Virgil used these quotes as a forefront to human nature's tendency to label things and put them inside of boxes. To the purist, it might look like an inside joke. To the tourist, it's almost a nod and a wink, affirming what's in their head. Right, it's just a shoe. It almost begs for dialogue to be had between the object and the viewer. If a shoe is just a shoe, what makes us value one over the other? Fashion isn't just fashion, because we can do great things with it. What that great thing is, and why we value certain objects over others. The existence of this very video, and the reason why you clicked on it, is the answer. It's the meaning, the ideas, and the stories that come with whatever vehicle of art it is. And Ablo believed that stories were necessary for all projects. He makes a great analogy in one of his talks about a candle. A dented, worn out candle in a garage would look like trash that someone would probably throw out, but put that candle in an all-white gallery space, all of a sudden, it becomes a piece of art. To see a great example of this, we have to go back to 2012, a time before Off-White. Taking Ralph Lauren flannel shirts that he purchased for $40, Virgil demonstrated how the value of an object can change based on its context and story. Growing up, a common sentiment around him was that the only way you could make it was by either selling drugs or becoming a star athlete. Virgil took this and channeled it into a graphic, which he screen printed over those Ralph Lauren flannels. They sold out, being priced at $550 after his modifications. But despite the hype, less than a year later, he actually discontinued the brand. Pyrex's vision was an important stepping stone for helping Virgil establish his reputation in the fashion world, and it was clearly evident he was aware of a bigger picture the entire time. In the words of Duchamp, I was interested in ideas, not in visual products. T-shirt, you're basically just adding value onto it. These things are canvas. This is a baseline cost, four dollars. But with the right idea in the right context, it can be something way more meaningful. So now we know about telling stories, but where do we get them from? As a younger designer myself, and especially when I first started, I felt like I just didn't have any experiences that I could really speak on. Well, the twist is that you don't need to learn the answer to that. Rather, you have to unlearn. A technique that Virgil Abloh described is going back to your 17-year-old version of yourself. What were you into? What did you know? The chances are it wasn't much, yet at the same time, it was simultaneously the time when you were the most fearless, are full of ideas, passions, and aren't overly constrained by conventional norms or limitations. Apple believed that by reconnecting with our younger selves, we can disrupt and create from an uninhibited creative angle. In fact, according to Virgil, just by nature of where you are born gives you the access to make things. We can see the greater importance of this when Virgil speaks on canons. Being from Chicago and having parents that emigrated from Ghana, West Africa, he felt a responsibility to contribute to the black canon of culture and art. Bring what canons you are a part of and build from there. By utilizing your individuality and history of who you are, aka going hyper-local, not only can you speak to the world, but it only makes you more distinct as that scale gets bigger. This seems especially relevant to us now in a time where trends have seemingly become world phenomenons with platforms like TikTok and Instagram. Trends like Y2K, punk, they aren't necessarily niche anymore. They might give in to the fear and concerns of cultural homogenization, but by never forgetting our core DNA, we can subvert that and bring a unique perspective to the world. The homogenization, it seems like a negative thing, but look at it the opposite. I'd say that homogenization is like it's a new global community that's a positive side effect of Instagram. For those of you that want to get ahead, get notoriety and do your dream, just play the opposite. The homogeny will also help you do something that stands out. Coincidentally, I actually started my own brand at 17 years old. I didn't know how to design fashion. I barely knew about fashion history, much less how to dress myself. I just did it. Imperfection, according to Virgil Abloh, is not a shortcoming, but rather an opportunity for progress. And rather than just embracing imperfection, he actively opposed the concept of perfection and what it stood for. Instead, Ablo believed in the power of speed and spontaneity. To him, iterating was more important than dwelling on if an idea was good or not. Pyrex's vision was the iteration that eventually led to Off-White. Virgil often talks about this as one's domino effect. You can never predict what first project will lead you to your dream job or career goal. Without Pyrex, there would be no Off-White. And without Off-White, there wouldn't be him becoming creative director at Louis Vuitton. Start your domino effect and produce bad work.
Arguably one of the most iconic collaborations in modern streetwear, the 10 collaboration with Nike and Virgil perfectly exemplifies this anti-perfect ethos. Approaching the collection, he decided that Nike shoes were so perfect they felt like they came out of a microwave. This led to the deconstruction of 10 iconic Nike shoe models, turning parts inside out and purposely making them appear worn right out of the box. The result wasn't a polished product, it was instead about showcasing the process, celebrating the concepts and overall pushing boundaries. The driving ethos put into the 10 collection proved to be so successful that Virgil has gone on to have over 50 plus designed shoes with Nike. Everyone's posting to sort of project like this finished version of themselves. Uh, I'm this person, like, and then you're, you're constantly living half digital, half real. Let's not lose sight of the fact that to be, you have to grow. You have to be a human. So you should never feel like you're complete. I feel like I'm 17 all the time. I still want to achieve and I want to make a dent. As I get older, I'm less into the tangible materialistic thing or even stuff that people think that I am. Like I'm more into doing better, learning. How can my whatever I have help somebody else? That should be my new challenge. In the face of progress, building communities accelerates change. Virgil recognized that by centralizing around issues, we can move faster as a whole. I've experienced that myself on a personal level, being part of various communities online like Streetwear Startup. Without being in that community, a lot of the knowledge and early seeds I received would have taken me much longer to formalize, and I would have made many more mistakes. Speaking on community, Virgil says that a lot of great design thinking happened with people coming together and practicing the same idea. I think about the Bauhaus as one of those. Super important contemporary design logic that has infected our now way of thinking. Donda was one of those, and that's something that I'd like to see more of, of the current generation. Design doesn't exist in test tubes or silos. This is the same concept that presides open source design. Art is meant to be reinterpreted, reused, and reimagined. And we can see this in Off-White's motifs of stripes and quotes. From this came the origins of Virgil's 3% rule approach when designing things. The rule essentially suggests that by changing an object or idea by just 3%, one can create something unique and innovative. Innovative. Bringing the community in is what makes a project feel much more holistic. One way Virgil did this was by using what he called a Trojan horse. In that same debut collection that referenced Wizard of Oz, this sweater with the silhouettes is almost the perfect symbol of that. On the four year anniversary of the show, Tremaine Emery, a longtime friend of Virgil, elaborated on the piece. Did you ever ask yourself why Dorothy, Tin Man, the Scarecrow, and the Cowardly Lion had their figures blacked out walking down the yellow brick road on a hand knitted sweater at Virgil's first LV show? Those characters represent Virgil, Ye, Dawn, IBN, and the rest of the Rouge Squadron that took the hero's journey into uncharted territory. Virgil tore the door off the hinges, and a whole generation of kids that don't look like the wizard got opportunities that never existed in fashion, design, and art. It all boiled, you know, boiled that down to community. Taking the derivative up, all these like high-level terms or things that we found, nothing supersedes community and oral stories. Nothing in the world is more valuable than conversation, and that it's, that it's archived. Once a community is established and we have that supportive system around us, central to this is the concept of collaboration, or as Virgil Abloh often referred to it, conversation. Collaboration coincides very much with what a large part of streetwear is, being unapologetic and breaking rules. A notable name that would certainly be considered a pioneer of this is a man by the name of Hiroshi Fujiwara. In the 80s, Hiroshi was a part of a creative collective known as the Harajuku Kids, which included other influential designers like Nigo of Bape or Jun Takahashi of Undercover, often regarded as the godfather of modern streetwear. One of his significant contributions is his navigation of collaboration or CO, a notation that Virgil himself adopted. Adopted. Hiroshi would lay out the blueprint to collaborating with brands, having a wide range of collaborations such as Nike or Pokemon, all the way to luxury brands such as Rolex and LV. An interesting crossing of paths occurred between Hiroshi and Virgil when Nike approached both of them to give their individual interpretations for the upcoming V10 collection. Ultimately, Nike liked and chose Virgil's version of the 10, but it comes to no surprise why the two were approached together in the first place. Hiroshi had his humble beginnings carving out his niche in Harajuku's vibrant fashion scene at the age of 18. Virgil, on the other hand, found his footing through Pyrex Vision and working at a boutique in Chicago. Both were also DJs, but most importantly, what Hiroshi and Virgil had in common was their ability and influence as tastemakers. Don't just use fashion as the genre. Music is a whole other genre. Art, fine art, gallery, furniture, ceramics. I think the next generation of fashion will look at a wider lens, then also participate in the traditional. 
Virgil also discusses how the first no is a good sign that you are trying to push boundaries forward, with the first no drives the great second idea. And it's likely this further exploration that allowed both Virgil and Hiroshi to successfully collaborate with so many different entities. With collaborations with Ikea and Rimoa, or Vitra and Mercedes-Benz, Virgil shows how collaboration provides an exciting way to cross-examine two ideas from polar opposites to create something completely new and unorthodox. And it's even more evident when you consider Fragment, Hiroshi's current brand, that the idea behind something can transcend the physical product itself. Often only slapping the Fragment logo on pre-existing products, you can start to see the through line between Duchamp's ready-made, Hiroshi Fujiwara, and Virgil's 3% approach. Virgil was a big proponent of having mentors, once saying, everyone needs a mentor. Without them, I'm just a kid that doesn't have any reaffirmation that my ideas are on the right track. Always be open to advice, and more importantly, just listening. It could come from someone as big as Hiroshi, or it could come from a friend. It could be older or younger. It can even be from someone alive or dead. Collaboration, whether official through two brands or just conversation between two people, can serve as a communicative device to bridge gaps and connect diverse perspectives. Collaboration, to me, I use that interchangeably with just the word conversation. You have to be able to converse to get your ideas out. No one of us exists just by ourselves in one room with a table. My biggest success is how I converse, how I, how I communicate my ideas. It's, it's how you communicate. What if Virgil never enrolled in that art history class in the Renaissance? What if he didn't study architecture and the seminal works of visionaries like Le Corbusier or Rem Koolhaas? In his own words, he would have remained on the path to becoming an engineer. With this in mind, let's look into what exactly took Virgil from the Renaissance to Renaissance man, and how we can all use this data to make history ourselves. As we delve into Abloh's philosophies, I think it's essential to first understand the roots and the diverse influences that shaped his artistic philosophy. Dadaism was an art movement of the early 20th century that emerged amidst World War I, rejecting logic, reason, and aestheticism of modern capitalist society. One of the most well-known artists from that movement was a man named Marcel Duchamp, a French painter and sculptor. Looking at Duchamp's work, it's hard to see where Virgil wasn't inspired. After attending a theater adaptation of Raymond Roussel's Impressions of Africa, Duchamp said that he felt that, as a painter, it was much better to be influenced by a writer than by another painter. And it's this interest in cross-genre pollination that not only influenced Duchamp, but also led to the domino effect that inspired Virgil almost 100 years later. One of his most infamous works, called The Fountain, exemplified the genre of ready-mades, which were ordinary objects reimagined as art. Bought from a store that sold plumbing fixtures, Duchamp took a urinal, turned it on its back, and signed it pseudonymously as R. Mutt, thus creating a new perception for an everyday object. Despite the controversy surrounding the piece, it ignited discussions questioning the nature of art itself. Virgil Abloh, much like Duchamp, made a name for himself by masterfully questioning and bending the preconceived definitions of what art and fashion could be. He embraced the ethos of Dadaism and the ready-mades, interpolating it into philosophies such as his 3% rule, or putting everything in quotes. And by doing so, Abel effectively used his platform to continue the conversation Duchamp initiated. And it doesn't stop just there. The creative ideas laid out traces its roots all the way back to the 1400s, to a period synonymous with cultural rebirth and intellectual revolution, the Renaissance. Virgil always repeated that we were currently in a Renaissance. What might that mean? Spanning the 14th to 17th century, the Renaissance marked a revival in art, literature, and learning. Individuals started to expand their capabilities and engaged in multiple disciplines, one of them most notably one of the greatest thinkers of mankind, Leonardo da Vinci. Let's look at a few points that served as the catalyst to the Renaissance, and what similar modern events parallel them to suggest that we might be in our own modern day Renaissance. The Renaissance era witnessed their own pandemic, the Black Death, the resulting societal impact, economic change, religious questioning, and shifts in social structures also lent to the inspiration of the Renaissance and the art that followed. There was also a shared experience of connectivity propelled by the invention of the printing press. Looking at today's landscape, the proliferation of digital technology like the internet is akin to such inventions both democratized information and learning, and opened up the possibilities for self-education in a variety of fields. With all this in mind, I do believe that our current circumstances echo the atmosphere of the Renaissance period. The opportunity to learn from the endless amounts of information available to market and create a business out of yourself, and getting exposure by putting yourself out there, it's all easier than ever with the internet. Inspired by past art movements and periods like Dada to the Renaissance, 
Virgil turned his attention to the world of fashion, and more specifically, streetwear. And just like the other periods of history, streetwear wasn't immune to the ebbs and flows of time either. Roughly in the 80s to early 90s marked the first wave with its roots in skate and surf cultures of California. This is where we saw the inception of Stussy by Sean Stussy, designing boards and t-shirts for the brand, and becoming the pioneer of the birth of streetwear. Later in the 90s, streetwear started gaining broader recognition and became increasingly associated with hip-hop culture, with brands like FUBU, Sean John, and Rockaware. Artists who donned oversized jeans, chunky sneakers, and graphic tees in music videos soon saw their style mimicked on the streets and in fashion. By then, streetwear had effectively become mainstream, but just as quickly as it peaked, it began to ebb. The late 90s and 2000s then saw the third wave, led by the Japanese designers such as Hiroshi, Niko, Jun Takahashi. To this day, Japanese influence on streetwear culture is still prominent. The fourth wave, roughly in the mid-2000s to now, is when arguably streetwear slowly started to become more mainstream again. While the rise of brands like Supreme or Palace that were still rooted in skate culture occurred, the lines between high fashion and streetwear began to blur around the same time. Designers like Alexander Wang, Carter Tishi, started incorporating streetwear elements into their designs. Off-White also came around this time and posed themselves as luxury streetwear. We can see the genre really permeating the mainstream fashion industry when the high fashion houses appointed streetwear designers as their creative directors, Virgil at Louis Vuitton or Kim Jones at Dior, all a testament to streetwear's influence. When Virgil talked about the death of streetwear, it's crucial to understand the statements said within the context of history. The statement wasn't meant to be a prophecy of an end, but rather an anticipation of the next waves and evolutions of the movement. But to sum it up, there's no better way to explain it other than streetwear is dead, in quotes. So, where are we now? On our third year of the 2020s, streetwear's aesthetic and ethos still proved to be valuable, with collaborations like Balenciaga and Adidas, Supreme and Swarovski, Pharrell being appointed the new director at Louis Vuitton, and even as mainstream as McDonald's collaborating with the streetwear brand Cactus Plant Flea Market. Some may see this absorption by the mainstream as streetwear's demise, but one thing that is for certain is that streetwear is evolving. By Virgil's definition, he saw it as not just a trend or category in fashion, but a historical art movement akin to the likes of the Renaissance or neoclassical etc. And his ultimate goal was that, by the end of his career, streetwear would be recognized as such. By doing something in the industry that no one had thought of. I guarantee your name will keep popping up if you keep doing that. What I don't want to see in the future is fashion that looks like the past. And not that it looks like that, that it just behaves like it. You know, behaves like a robot. Like, you know, Virgil Abloh was more than just a visionary in the fashion and design space. He put focus into philanthropy and was an advocate for the youth. Through his countless initiatives like the Postmodern Scholarship Fund, school lectures, and his dedicated free game page, he wasn't here to just shape the here and now. Virgil also believed in the future. Let's look at his perspective on the future, a vision deeply intertwined with the dynamics of technology, the pace of culture, and the spirit of innovating. Even during his early years at LV, Virgil kept his mind on the kids that would one day supersede him. One day, heading into the LV office, Virgil was stopped by a guard, not knowing that he was supposed to be there, but rather than being offended by it, he understood his position and the impact that imagery alone could give to the culture, and saw it as too low level to focus on. In his own words, what's a more impressive image is me at the end of the runway for LV, and that image coming to a young kid in Atlanta who wants to be a fashion designer that can tell his parents that he wants to go to fashion design because he can use me as an example. Rather than subscribing to the common dystopian notions of technology, Virgil always advocated to see the good and how it was a tool that people could utilize. He saw places like Instagram and the internet as a gift, and our phones as our crowbar to pry open how we as humans exist on the planet. During his collaborations with Nike, he talked about how he used WhatsApp to communicate his design ideas, sending them through sketches and notes. Using this tool that each of us possesses in our pocket, Virgil was able to do what he called his number one career advice, doing multiple things at one time and multitasking. Virgil also had a nuanced understanding of how algorithms were shaping our lives, once saying, before you could just show two times a year, but Instagram, whether you like it or not, moves faster our culture moves faster. He accepted these new systems as part of our future and encouraged others to acknowledge that it was present, while also pointing out the potential dangers of being at its mercy and sacrificing individuality in the process. Such sentiments are especially relevant today, seeing things like the beastification of YouTube or content getting faster and shorter from TikTok. Digging deeper into his perspective on technology's impact, Virgil explored the nature of ownership and possession in the digital age. He brought up a compelling argument 
asserting, if I own a piece of clothing or artwork, but I don't have it in my possession, say it's in storage or a different city, I still feel that I own it and that makes me happy. I'm likening that to the whole gaming experience. Interestingly, shortly after his passing, it was revealed that he actually had plans to take part in a DAO project aka Decentralized Autonomous Organization. In basic terms, it's a club that's run by rules that everyone in the club agrees on. A PDF of the unrealized project titled Skyscraper was dropped online, outlining how it intended to be a digital museum that used its proceeds to cultivate a roster of artists. Whether navigating through different genres or manifesting art in either the tangible or digital, one thing remained constant, Virgil was always building. Beyond physical or digital possession, Virgil posited that knowledge could be a powerful form of ownership in its own right. Once stating, no one owns anything anymore, but if you have knowledge of a certain chair, then it becomes a part of your dinner conversation. I've never personally owned Off-White or Louis Vuitton myself, yet it's likely that me and you are still able to have this dialogue and already have an understanding of what Virgil and his work stood for. He spoke about intentionally making certain elements of Off-White and LV free, such as the fashion shows, the behind the scenes, the show notes, and that it was done purposefully for the younger version of himself who couldn't afford an LV wallet but would study the designer behind something to have a deeper understanding. This to him was the future of fashion. Fast content is readily available, and now with AI information, it's more accessible than ever. But what's important and still valuable is the deep knowledge and expertise that can't be directly expressed. Virgil elaborates this further with his concept of the formal and the formal. The agreed upon formal represents the accepted textbook understanding of something, being taught in school, reading in the encyclopedia, researching online. This is a kind of formal that is endorsed and largely agreed upon by the academia and the wider industry. The second formal that Virgil speaks about is one that is naturally occurring. He points back to his origins of Ghana and how there is an architectural language there that is organic. Such formality might not be recognized in mainstream stream architectural discourse or found in textbooks, but it's still intrinsically valuable in its own unique, culturally informed way. And he notes that, despite his education, one thing that professors weren't able to teach was culture. It was his off hours of listening to rap, doing graffiti, and hanging out with friends, which significantly led to his fashion perspective and understanding. And for getting a career in fashion, or any role that you might have in any industry for that matter, his advice was about creating your own platform as a demonstration of your abilities and vision. As he put it, Off-White was my business plan. Off-White was my resume. The way I carried myself, the way I organized my shows. I would look at every season to be like, if I was at a house, this is what you guys should be doing. A person that does this becomes a natural candidate when new positions open up because they've demonstrated not just potential but proven capability. Throughout this journey into Virgil Abloh's innovative mind, we've seen the essence of his philosophy and how it incorporated into his own work. It's some of these same principles that he truly believed would ultimately be the future of design as a whole. He anticipated a future where we wouldn't be able to see a defined edge of each genre, and with this merging, one discipline would inform the other in a circular, unbounded process, much like how creativity naturally occurs. For Virgil, that was connecting DJing with fashion fashion with architecture, and so on. Rather than focusing 100% on one thing, Virgil proclaimed that 80% was the future. Although having inspirations and roots from eras prior, all movements are evolutions from the previous that build and add on on top of that history. This is what Virgil warns about when saying what he doesn't want to see is something that looks and behaves just like the past like a robot. It's therefore our role to challenge presiding generations and question ourselves in what we should do differently from them. Encapsulated in eras of time are the creations, the creators, and the world simultaneously influencing and reflecting each other. By looking outside and addressing these problems or issues we are experiencing, we stimulate a discourse that elevates our creations beyond just the realm of aesthetics and the bottom line of it all. Virgil said that the ultimate goal as a creator was to open doors. Virgil Abloh's aspirations were tragically cut short by his untimely passing, but his impact on the world and the seeds of ideas he planted endured. It's now up to the living generation, who still have the opportunity to continue Virgil's legacy in creating in the light of his ideologies. It's with these talks that he's devoted his time to, to not only explaining his process, but laying out a blueprint for generations to come, just as his predecessors did for him. The irony is that it all is like how do you in your in your time on earth create a seat at the table because i thought it was impossible you know everyone would tell me it was impossible i came from one printed t-shirt <laughs> in new york city 
And I was like, one day I'm gonna figure it out. When I started my very first collection, Peter already knows my style. It was called Pyrex. Like, and it takes stumbling, and I was making it from my basement. It takes succeeding, it takes being misunderstood. It's a little bit unfortunate because I'm not a suit. I don't take days off. If it's about work ethic and creativity, every day I can do this. I'm not gonna let that talk end in such a suit manner. I can sleep at night knowing that we're doing the work. Yeah, keep them coming. Let's stay on for a little bit above and below the ground to sort of make sure there's more me, frankly. I'm not, we're not gonna end with like leaving so many questions unanswered. The next version of me didn't go to fashion school either. Highly ambitious, super creative. One last one. And I know maybe 50 of them. Let's do one more They question. will take my position. Please. One more. <laughs> they will be the head of Louis Vuitton next. They will start another version of Off-White or a media company. Put yourself in my shoes. It's super weird to have this light on me. I'm not that special. You guys are born at a very awesome, distinct time. Like, I think that this is the renaissance. Don't get sort of trapped into like this, everything sucks, the world is like coming to an end. That's just like an internal mechanism basically to chill. When you don't have to put yourself out there, you can like wake up every day and come up with excuses, but. This is my perspective on, you know, life is short and you're always trying to like, get ideas out and have people feedback so you can do more. And with that, this is over. Uh, one more.